Good afternoon. My name is Ruby Conning and I'm representing St Kentian College. We have come to the conclusion that we, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, have decided to maintain the current official cash rate at 2.5%. Our decision is made in recognition of the policy targets agreement between the Reserve Bank Governor and the Minister of Finance, whereby the bank should keep future CPI inflation between 1 to 3 per cent over the medium term. I will briefly be reviewing the recent economic and financial market developments before I pass you on to my team of Fraser French, Andrew Hughes and Matthew Ansell, just to expand on the current economic conditions, which we will base on the aggregate demand equation. In this, Fraser will touch on commodity prices, the New Zealand dollar, and then lead on to fiscal policy. Then Andrew will speak about inflation, inflationary expectations, along with capacity utilisation and employment. Lastly, Matt will examine how debt levels and interest rates impact on consumption, and will discuss the improved monetary policy traction. I will then return to conclude today's presentation and review the risks involved in keeping the OCR at 2.5%. Recent data has shown domestic growth to be higher than earlier anticipated. Following February's Christchurch earthquake, we have seen an improvement in New Zealand's economic conditions. As you can see, although recent growth has been higher than earlier anticipated, it still remains below the average over the past 20 years. We have seen an increase in inflationary expectations over recent months. Global growth has been weaker than anticipated. There are still major concerns about the about economic conditions globally. For example, the major issue confronting Europe is the spiralling debt crisis. The increasing 10-year interest rates shown is a representation of the increasing risks, in, increasing risks associated with these nations' ability to meet their debt obligations. This highlights the fundamental weaknesses in their respective economies. Also, unemployment in the United States has remained persistently high due to sluggish growth. This is keeping the Federal Reserve's interest rates on hold and contributing to excess capacity in the US economy. New Zealand headli headline inflation remains persistently high while above, above the 1-3% to range, while core inflation is pushing higher. Also, commodity prices remain firm and there has been continued strength in the New Zealand TWI. Business confidence has remained robust. As shown on this graph, it has been a similar story with consumer confidence. As Ruby said, the New Zealand dollar has continued to strengthen. Strong demand from major trading partners like Australia, China and other Asian markets has offset stagnant demand from Europe and America. The underperforming European and American economies has seen the New Zealand dollar appreciate against the Euro and US dollar. This can be seen here in the TWI chart where we have seen recent increases to highs of 75. This reflects the strength of our New Zealand dollar against our major trading partners. Strong commodity prices will lead to a boost in exporters' incomes, which will boost both rural and urban economies. Commodity prices, as you see here, continue to be high in world terms. However, the strength of the New Zealand dollar will offset much of this effect and will also see imports becoming relatively cheaper. A strong New Zealand dollar will reduce aggregate demand and ultimately put downward pressure on domestic inflation. Also impacting upon aggregate demand will be the impact of the 2011 budget announcement. This announcement forecasts significant fiscal tightening and much of this tightening is to be implemented through cuts to government spending in areas such as KiwiSaver and working for families. This will reduce disposable income for many households and should serve to reduce inflationary pressures by cutting the government expenditure comp component of the aggregate demand equation. Recent increases in the cost of living for New Zealanders has seen headline inflation exceed the 1-3% to target ban. This increase in headline inflation to above 5% over recent months is largely due to an increase in energy prices and the residual effect of a GST increase to 15% in October of last year. However, the bank's policy target is to keep CPI inflation outcomes between 1-3% to on average over the medium term. Therefore, we believe that this spike in headline inflation does not require immediate action as, this, as the head, core inflation is expected to remain within this target band. Evidence of further increases in core inflation will need to be addressed with further policy action. Of concern has been the significant increase in forward-looking inflation expectations, as you can see over recent, recent times. Should these expectations become entrenched in core medium-term inflation, 
we'll need to counteract these to show that core inflation sits comfortably within, between the target band over the medium term. This is one area that we will monitor closely. Reduced demand in the employment market has been observed. We've shown the graph here which shows unemployment at a high 6.6% in the March 11 quarter. This is despite small improvements in both business and consumer confidence. As a consequence, wage, press, wage pressures are comfortably contained at around 2% per annum. Decreased demand for residential and commercial property, shown here by a decrease in housing turnover, means that there is also large spare capacity in the construction market, as less projects are being undertaken. The high unemployment, coupled with the weak housing market, has led to a negative output gap, which you can see here. A negative output gap implies that the economy is not operating at its full potential, and in such market conditions, there is limited pressure on inflation. However, the increase in investment due to the Canary earthquake will likely see an increase in AD. However, however, there is evidence to suggest that this reconstruction process could be delayed due to problems with insurance availability. This will delay the rebuild, the onset of increase in AD, and consequent inflationary pressures. But we cannot look at New Zealand in isolation. Recent data from the IMF, as you can see here, shows significant negative output gaps across most global economies. Only emerging Asia at the top is in positive territory. Emerging Asia has provided significant demand for our exports over recent times. This has been positive for our economy, but it also highlights risk should emerging Asian growth begin to slow. As we can see on this graph, household debt levels remain close to all-time highs of around 150% of disposable income. The high debt levels gives the Reserve Bank significant traction when looking to implement monetary policy, as any in increase in interest rates will directly impact upon households' disposable income and consumption. The improvement in agricultural incomes, coupled with, coupled with the influx of people expected to come here for the Rugby World Cup, is likely to cause an increase in economic activity for the second half of 2011. This will see an increase in aggregate demand, and therefore could cause increased demand for our goods and services, and could potentially lead to increase in price levels. Now in comparison to previous years, there has been a major shift from fixed rate mortgages to floating rate mortgages. In fact, now more than 80% of mortgages have a duration of less than 12 months. This means that any actions from the bank will have immediate effects in the economy. The OCR is at historic lows, and it can be argued that monetary policy is extremely stimulative as a consequence. However, as the graph shows here, there is a large difference between the OCR, floating mortgage rates, and business-based lending rates. In fact, business-based lending rates are high by historic standards, and even floating mortgage rates are not reflective of a 2.5% OCR. Understanding this concept is important in policy setting, and when coupled with the extremely high TWI, it highlights that overall monetary conditions are already a lot tighter than the 2.5% OCR would imply. The decision to keep the OCR unchanged at 2.5% should ensure core medium term inflation remains within the 1-3% to target band agreed in the policy targets agreement. There are clearly reasons why we may look to tighten the monetary policy. These include headline inflation becomes entrenched, rising inflationary expectations, strong commodity prices and buoyant business and consumer confidence. On the other hand, reasons to ease include extreme uncertainty in the global outlook, high TWI coupled with high effective interest rates, the projected fiscal tightening, also we have a negative output gap stemming from the weak housing and labour markets. However, weighing up these factors, we believe there does not need to be any change in the OCR at this point in time. There are clearly risks to this decision, however. Delaying increasing interest rates could result in, in increased inflationary pressures. However, tightening too early may result in jeopardising growth and potentially causing medium-term inflation to fall below the 1% target band, or worse still, risking deflation. In conclusion, we believe current monetary conditions are, are appropriate given the uncertainty in the economic outlook. However, should the outlook for core medium-term inflation increase, the Reserve Bank should have no hesitation in removing monetary stimulus. Thank you. Great. Thank you for your presentation. You can take a seat. Uh, so we've got, we've got 20 minutes of question and answer time now. Uh, so as in the regionals, we invite you to discuss the answer amongst yourselves first, and then if someone could bring that all together and give us a final answer, that would be great. But also, if you could please speak up, not only so that we can hear you, but so that the microphones can pick you up. 
So I'll start things off. How has the financial crisis affected monetary policy in New Zealand? Well, the financial crisis sort of decreasing overall stability in the world and a lot of investors are a lot more tentative in whether they want to invest in anything or not. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the price of money in the world has sort of gone up, so that means New Zealand Reserve Bank doesn't have to put so much, doesn't have to increase its own interest rates so much yeah. as banks already have interest rates yeah. high to attract overseas. Yeah, I think before the global financial crisis we saw a lot of banks were borrowing short term um, in order to fund all their, all their lending. Mm -hmm. uh, and post the GFC we've seen uh, a lot of reserve banks and governments around the world um, sort of forcing these banks to um, diversify their, their borrowing. Um, and this is sort of increasing their, their costs and their funding, their sort of, um, you know, Relaying these costs onto um, consumers, and this is sort of impacting the the whole wedge uh, that we see. That we've so we've got higher effective interest rates. So I think what that means for monetary policy is it can be a little bit um, easier. We can have lower uh, interest rates. Yeah, because the banks already having to yeah. keep interest rates high. Yeah. Can you for you give your final answer? Can you mm -hmm. show the chart of the OCR versus lending rates? Uh, which one was OCR lending rates? This one. Towards yeah. the, start. the conclusion. That one there. There we are. How, how does what the information that's in that chart reflect potentially your answer? Well, the effective interest rates, uh, which I mean, uh, households around New Zealand um, really see, are the um, floating mortgage rates and also the business based lending rates, which are, as you can see, they're a lot higher than what two and a half percent would um, would imply, really. So, um, yeah, the overall monetary condition is a lot tighter. Um, than what the 2.5% would really imply. Yeah. In the past, you can see that the gap between the OCR and the business-based lending rates is a lot smaller. So that means that the OCR is already closely reflected in what market interest rates are. But now we're seeing business-based lending rates a lot higher than the OCR. So that means already monetary policy doesn't need to be implemented higher because the overall business-based lending rates are already having a... And we're sort of seeing... Before the global financial crisis, the OCR was like around 4.5%, or not quite there, 8% um, because they were trying to control inflation. But um, since the global financial crisis, we've seen the OCR drop dramatically to try and encourage growth in the economy. It's 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 more yeah. I mean, sure, if you look between the blue line and the purple line, you see the spreads between the yeah. two just blow out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not an accident that financial markets call that the spread. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. Um, so, well, before the global financial crisis, we saw um, banks they they usually uh, borrow short term to fund all their all their lending. Um, that that sort of that um, exposed them in the financial crisis, and saw a lot of them actually shut down. Um, so, post financial crisis, we've seen uh, governments and reserve banks force these banks to diversify their their borrowing. Um, so we've seen an increase in their funding costs and this is reflected in the effective interest rates which they're passing on to households. And so what this really means for monetary policy is that we can um, be a lot more uh, sort of relaxed and a lot more loose in our monetary policy because these effective interest rates um, are, yes, as you can controlling see there's inflation. controlling inflation are much higher. Right, thank you. Why does the Reserve Bank have an inflation target of between 1 and 3%? What's so special about one? Yeah. <laughs> well, one, three, well, sorry. Yeah. one to three percent is, yeah. is price stability in the economy. Anything above that doesn't allow for businesses to plan for the future with their investment. Yeah. And it really decreases our competitiveness in the overseas export market. Yeah, high inflation. We've actually got a graph on that, haven't we? Yeah, we've, I've we've got a... We um, put a graph at the at end. The end that which, oh, we, what this shows here, um, here but um, in the past when we've had inflation or high inflation um, we've seen that growth has been really unstable um, but you see when you get the growth between that one to three percent since it was 1992 there um, we've seen you know pretty sustainable and strong growth um, so I think the important thing is about one to three percent and why you wouldn't want you don't want negative definitely because you're risking deflation which is mm -hmm. another and then anything of sort of above three percent you're risking an inflationary spiral where prices continue to go up and that will lead to even greater amounts of inflation, so 
one to three percent is yeah a s stable financial conditions which allows a lot of growth in the yeah. economy. It's keeping it away from that deflation, possible deflation, because that's quite dangerous in an, in an economy. Because what we've seen, there's no been, there's never been really any real evidence of banks being able to control deflation, because yeah. you just get into that deflationary spiral, yeah. and yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Can you sum it up. I'll do it. Yep. So one to three percent is a price stability in the economy. Anything above is not stimulative for like a right. constant growth. Anything below could be risk the chance of deflation, the deflationary spiral. So one to three percent is price stability allows businesses to plan for future investment, and it also keeps us competitive overseas with our exports. Yeah, very good. Um, <coughs> looking at that chart, um, when we had high inflation, the growth rates seemed to be, at least on average, a lot lower. What would cause that? Why would inflation damage the economy? Inflation is obviously making a more volatile business market, so businesses are constantly having to guess what their price is going to be. There's possibility they'll offset investment, which is what's leading to the log. Yeah. Um, consumers don't know whether the price is going to go up or going to stay sort of similar, so they're going to possibly go out buy now, causing more inflation, not necessarily. Well, if if we're seeing like high inflation, um, it's likely that consumers will see prices to go up, and so yeah, so consumption would increase now, meaning um, disposable income would fall, which isn't necessarily. Um, mm. It's, it's, short -term. it's more of like a, a short-term um, yeah, effect. Into, you get into those spirals, then it's hard for businesses to plan, and we'll talk about that. Yeah. Mm, because because of high inflation, wage spiral. we risk a, a wage price spiral. Where mm -hmm. Consumers are seeing a decrease in their disposable income, so they're going to demand higher incomes. So they're able to purchase the same amount of goods, and this just compounds to get that inflationary spiral. Mm. And that's really detrimental to the economy. Yeah, so a high inflation environment makes businesses, makes it hard for businesses to plan for the future, and so this means investments often offset. As you can see there, it's quite volatile. You have high, high growth, low growth, so in comparison, a nice steady inflation has steady growth as businesses can plan effectively for the future and have steady investment. Okay, so many large countries around the world <coughs> have cut their interest rates close to zero. What are some of the implications of having zero interest rates for, for your own economy? Mm -hmm. Zero is obviously stimulative for the economy, trying to get, get the country to spend yeah. more in terms of trying to get growth. Yeah. To Increase investment. Um. Yeah, I think well, in a lot of countries around the world have huge, a lot of debt on board. Um, so mm -hmm. and low interest rates for them means that um, they're not having to spend as much servicing some of their debt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also they're trying to kickstart their economies, especially the, you see the states and yeah. quite a few of the European countries. Their uh, economies of growth is really slow at the moment, and we saw that with our unemployment um, growth. We're trying to they're trying to stimulate the economy um, mm -hmm. through both governments with the fiscally um, their spending and also with extremely low interest rates. Mm -hmm. Also um, with zero interest rates basically means people are not, they, they don't really want to save their money, they'd rather spend it and invest more now, meaning people might start, like we often do in New Zealand, spend more than our actual income, which could in fact be um, in the long term resulting in spend spending more. now rather than yeah. later could be deflationary for our economy in the long term. Um, so now? Yep. What? Right, so now. No, I think you right, um, Well, we've seen um, in the States and also in Europe, we've seen the, the debt that the countries have got on board, um, huge amounts of debt. Um, and the low interest rates um, obviously decrease their um, the service that, yeah, the servicing uh, costs of that debt. And also we've seen um, all of these countries are trying to kickstart their economies because they're, well, especially post the financial crisis, they're really struggled to, to grow and we've seen really low growth and high un unemployment. So we're, they're really trying to, um, with the tools they have available, trying to kickstart the economies again with low interest rates. Um, stimulate growth. Yeah, just to stimulate the growth. Yeah, so what are the other options if, if you're not boosting that growth, what are some of the options that policymakers can do to stimulate growth? Got the three real main tools that like, authorities have 
We have the governments where they can control their spending fiscally. Um, a lot of governments around the world have large amounts of debt at the moment, so they're having to cut back. And then we have the OCR, but we've seen like in the United States where the OCR is pretty much at zero. It's the only other real tool they have is quantitative easing. So they're trying to print more money, and this is increasing the supply of the money, and the demand's not there, so the dollar's going to depreciate. And this is trying to make their exports more competitive on a worldwide market. And this is sort of... Increasing demand for the exports, trying to build boost their growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just with a fiscal policy, a lot of countries are already sort of nearing a limit. Like, you can see the US having to raise their debt ceiling because they're already spending, trying to spend so much to get the economy going. So fiscal policy, yeah, has a limit. Yeah. There's not a lot more that they can spend, really. Yeah. Um, so quantitative reasons is becoming their only option. Yeah. So, to sum that up, Governments around the world are having to cut back on their spending because they're already put on so much debt. So the central banks are putting the interest rates pretty much as low as possible to try to stimulate the growth. And as we're seeing in the United States, they're having to implement quantitative easing to try and boost the economy by devaluing the dollar and making the exports more competitive. So what is quantitative easing? How does a central bank actually put more cash into the economy? What do they actually do? Um. Basically, printing more money. Well, they, yeah. print, printing the money. Um, mm -hmm. Putting more into the supply. Yeah, so effectively, they're possibly increasing transfer payments, more government expenditure. Mm -hmm. I don't know about that. I don't know if it's really. Just more yeah, government for the moment in terms yeah. of the they can't do anything yeah. else. Yeah. I suppose we've printed a whole bunch of money and it's sitting in our vaults. How do we get it in, into the hands of the private sector? Oh, right. Mm. Um, So, what would they do to, in terms of is this in terms of the Reserve Bank? What the yeah, Reserve so Bank? The Reserve do? Bank. Um, <coughs> well, I think supply of money. I think it would banks come through and yeah. um, take on on board quite a lot of that. Um, yeah, well, the Reserve Bank is lending out money to sort of to other banks, private banks. Yeah, um, yeah. and I think are they perhaps making the borrowing just allowing people to borrow money with the Increase. Good question. Um, I think we're probably not too sure, actually. <laughs> it's about shifting the balance sheet. So yeah. the Reserve Bank has to basically take something off the private sector that it already has, and in exchange, give it cash. Yeah. It's going to be the is the, is the mechanism. Okay. And there's there's various things, but the easiest thing for a central bank to buy is financial assets whether that be equities or bonds or something. Yeah. Okay. And we'd hold those on our balance sheet and deliver yeah. cash. It's okay. It was a reasonably challenging yeah. question, oh. so that's okay. Don't, don't panic about that. <laughs> uh, if I can shift on to um, our, our credit rating. Imagine Standard & Poor's or Moody's uh, downgrading our New Zealand's credit rating. Yeah. What would be the implications? Oh, first of all, well, funding costs would increase. Um, yeah. It's obviously seen as a, a riskier nation to invest in. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say probably see that wedge widening further. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. people are gonna people already see New Zealand as a slightly risky risky country because it's isolated, export reliant. So yeah, to c try and keep getting in our investment that we need to fund our spending, we're gonna have to increase interest rates to reflect that risk of the downgraded downgraded rating. Yeah. So, so see, yeah, effective out. interest rates higher, sort of, and this is gonna. Control inflation for the Reserve Bank, making their job a little bit easier as well. Mm -hmm. But what are the what are the other effects that that's going to have on our economy with the downgrading credit ratings? I think the main is the main the leaning, leaning rates. Um, yeah, just market interest rates, I suppose, are well, uh, going up. In terms of the exchange rate and New Zealand dollar, and probably see. Yeah. yeah, demand for the New Zealand dollar will be higher. Yeah, I'd say so because interest rates are higher. Therefore, we're <coughs> better to. Uh, it could be seen to be better to invest because there's a higher return. However, we could also be seen to be more risky. So yeah, so yeah. it's going to be sort of yeah. cancel that. I'd say it out. would go down in a way, yeah. wouldn't it? The New Zealand yeah. dollar. I think I'll just sort of sum that up. Um, mm. With the, if we saw the New Zealand credit rating um, downgraded, funding costs um, in New Zealand would uh, increase, and we see that wedge. Um, 
you know, widen further. I think f if we bring this back to the Reserve Bank, um, it would make the job at the moment a lot easier in terms of that, that sort of controlling the inflation. Um, they can probably keep the interest rates fairly, um, well, like we said, keeping um, depends. Well, it's, I mean, it's probably good for the probably good for the reserve. <laughs> might be good for the reserve bank. Actually, but, um, but no, it's not. It no, it's not. Good, it's not a good thing. Um, having your credit rating downgraded. Um, you want to be a strong, stable economy. Um, so it doesn't just reflect your. Um, you know, the recession also reflects if you get downgraded that perhaps your business, um, your businesses aren't sort of doing so well. Yeah, you no, want to mm -hmm. do so well. So. The only way we could sort of benefit from that is if the, um, with it becoming considered more riskier, the New Zealand dollar, the value of the New Zealand dollar, well, the exchange rate would fall, causing our exports to be more competitive, yeah. and um, that's sort of how we could. Yeah. I, think overall, I think overall, you, you wouldn't yeah. want, no one really wants a, a downgrading, keep nice and strong. Yep. Yeah, but there are some offsetting factors yeah, like yeah. the exchange rate. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Migration uh, has been declining over the last few months. What do you think are some of the implications of this for the economy and for inflation? So by near migration do you mean people leaving or coming? So more people are leaving than arriving permanently. And you're saying it's decreasing? Or That's a net, yes, net, net migration. Yeah. More so people decreasing. leaving, so, so okay, more um, leaving, yeah. Well I think it's all about, if we lose some of our, some of our skilled workers over to Australia, um, which yeah isn't good for our overall growth um, and that side of things. I think if we look at the Rugby World Cup, temporarily we're going to have a, a boost in people that, what was it, 80,000 people that are going to be coming yeah. over here from overseas. Sorry, by migration, just to clarify, I'm talking about uh, permanent, oh, permanent. Term. so oh, not, oh, not oh, just saying, tourists okay. and yeah. things, but people actually moving right. yep. to live elsewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so basically we'd start off with, if there's more people leaving, we're getting a, you know, um, demand is falling. Yeah, um, which has that country. effect on aggregate demand, yeah. um, which we can see, and um, causing growth to slow, yep. which then yeah, yeah could affect take off pressures from inflation and losing skilled labour. Yeah, seeing money leave the economy. So technically, you could see New Zealand dollar. I suppose it's not a massive factor, but demand for the New Zealand dollars falling with people leaving the country. So you're going to see the price of the New Zealand dollar falling fractionally, not. Mm -hmm. So how would that result on interest rates and, and what the, the Reserve Bank would do in terms of monetary policy? Because if we're seeing um, aggregate demand falling, fall. it wouldn't be a, a strong fall, but if it's a consistent decrease in net migration, yeah. consistently falling. It would allow the Reserve Bank to keep the OCR unchanged because we're yeah. sort of pushing towards the to the towards the top end of the limit. Yeah. So make less inflation, make the Reserve Bank's job easier because they can keep the OCR unchanged. Yeah, keep, yeah, keep in, uh, inflation relatively under control. Under control. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you would have to be careful that it doesn't sort of yeah. you know, yeah. cause anything too much lower than, yeah. So to sum that up, way. we would lose, <laughs> people are leaving the economy, so we're losing consumption, we're losing skilled labour, which will overall decrease AD and reduce growth and should allow the Reserve Bank to keep the OCR unchanged. Great, that's good. Um, and what would happen to spare capacity in the economy? That would widen, I think. Yeah, I think, yeah. If you're, especially if you're seeing skilled labourers go overseas, you're seeing a lot more... Efficient? Yeah, a lot. Well, there's, if people are leaving that are currently occupying jobs, you're going to see a lot more unemployment in the sector, and if we don't have the qualified labourers to fill those gaps, we're seeing, I suppose, spare capacity will be increasing because people who can fill those jobs having to be replaced by people possibly less qualified, mm. which means that we're not allocating people's Results jobs. Yeah, well, right. it's likely that because we're such an isolated country and um, the, the skilled jobs we have here might be in higher demand overseas, like a lot of people um, may see themselves as being able to get a, a better a better paying, higher paying job overseas. So we're seeing a lot of our skilled workers um, leave and let probably less skilled workers um, come to New price. Zealand. Um, so that's, yeah, definitely affecting. Yeah, I think speed capacity will be increasing. Yeah? Just a little. I'm trying to 
quickly summarize where we've got to. Okay. Uh, so, um, basically, what we're seeing is because we're such an isolated nation and net migration is falling, a lot of people um, might, might think that they can get a higher paying job overseas and therefore leave to go overseas. So that we're seeing a lot of people go to Australia for higher paying jobs and these are taking away a lot of our, um, our more skilled workers and probably we'd have to replace them with maybe less skilled workers that we're, we're getting from um, some of the, the island nations that are migrating to New Zealand and other places. Um, so in, as a result, um, our spare capacity would be increasing. So we'll leave it there. That's the last question. Okay. You can now relax. Okay, thank you.